Hello, I'm Susan Taylor, the director of the New Orleans Museum of Art. And as we continue to celebrate the exhibition of Queen Nefertari's Egypt here at NOMA, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Christian Greco, director of the Museo Egizio in Turin, from whose collections he, these marvelous objects on view in the exhibition are drawn. Dr. Greco has served as the Museo Egizio's director since 2014, and during his tenure has spearheaded a number of initiatives for the museum, several of which you'll hear about today. The Museo Egizio is the world's oldest museum devoted to the arts of Egypt and is home to one of the most important collection of ancient Egyptian material outside of Cairo. Dr. Greco is a distinguished scholar, archeologist and museum leader. He received his PhD in Egyptology from the Universita di Pisa in 2014 or the University of Pisa and has undertaken extensive archeological field work in Egypt. He has worked at several museums, including the Rijksmuseum in Leiden and taught at a number of institutions throughout the world. I'm delighted that Dr. Greco could be with us today to introduce to us the Museo Gizio, its collections and the exciting projects he and his staff are undertaking. Welcome, Dr. Greco, to NOMA. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. I, I'm so glad to be part of the exhibition, even if at distance. And uh, I'm so glad that your public is enjoying the exhibition at the moment. I has the possibility to see so many parts of our collection that are so important, both for our museum, but also for the history of Egyptology. I, so even if from Turing, I'm really connected to NOMA and to the exhibition, and uh, I would like to introduce you today to the history of our museum and to the activity we are doing in order to understand the biography of the objects. So first of all, I would like to um, say what is Museo Egizio? Uh, most of you probably have never heard of it, but don't really know what uh, our museum is. We are placed in Italy, in Turin, is the northwestern part of the country. We are the most the ancient Egyptian museum in the world. We were founded in 1824. Just to give you a reference, the um, archaeological museum in the Tahrir Square nowadays, well, the Tahrir in, in Egypt, the Tahrir Square Museum was opened in 1902, but the first part of the museum opened in Bulak in 1863. So our museum in Italy was opened more than 40 years before uh, uh, its counterpart opened in Egypt. Having such a stratified history puts us at the center of Egyptology because through this collection and through our galleries, the most important scholars of Egyptology have come and have developed their research and theory concerning uh, the uh, decipherment of hieroglyphs, the understanding on the language and the development of ancient Egyptian uh, civilization. We have more than uh, 10,000 objects showed in our permanent gallery. Before COVID, we used to have more than nine, 900,000 visitors per year, which makes us the sixth most visited museum in Italy. And we are currently have 19 research projects, which is really something that I really care about. We have been having loans in four continents. We have been having traveling exhibition in the four continents. Uh, the, the only place we haven't been yet is Australia, but we have traveled extensive in Asia, in the United States, in Europe, in South America. And we are very active, of course, in Egypt, but you will hear about it because it's the place where we have our field work. This has brought us to Publish in different languages and, and, and it shows how important internationally our museum is. Just to give you a brief history and to tell you where we are, we are in a beautiful Baroque building in the city center of Turin. You see here just a plan of how our building looks like and you see also brief history. 
it goes back to the 17th century when this building was formed as a kind of boarding school from the aristocrats living in Turin. And then in 1824, the collection arrived and this became the seat of the Museo Egizio. And in 1894, when Schiaparelli became director of this museum, uh, the excavation started in Egypt and our collection has enormously been um, expanded. In 2015, we reopened a completely renewed museum and we are working hard now for the next transformation, which will be in 2024, when we will celebrate 200 years anniversary of our foundation. Let me show you the uh, amount of work we went through when we decided to renew the museum. So in 2015, we had to remove most of the objects in our galleries because the galleries were completely being reworked and rebuilt. Can you imagine how difficult it is in a Baroque building in the center of Italy to move in completely safety all the objects while the visitors are still coming while working is going on? This is the very moment when the uh, burial goods of the tomb of Kha, the only intact tomb preserved uh, of the new kingdom preserved outside of Egypt was moved. Well, you see here the week of merit, you see the different sarcophagi and coffins which have to be moved around and go to the new places that were just uh, prepared for the collection. And you know how difficult it was. The, the objects that you see are more than 3,000 years old, and you can imagine how cautious everybody had to be in moving the objects. And we had to be inventive as well. This is the very moment when the uh, Book of the Dead Papyrus of Kha was removed. It's 40 meter 50, so we had to develop a kind of will to roll it up and unroll in the presence of 20 conservators who were uh, <clears throat> supervising that all the fibers would be maintained. The same went for all our reeds material, our bronze. The museum really during the renovation changed into a working place where more than 200 conservators were working, cleaning, rehydrating so that the objects themselves could move. It was also an excellent moment to rethink and understand what is our role. Uh, actually, we're a research center, so, so it was a moment to enhance uh, uh, X-rays activities and all kinds of documentation that we had to do on the material because nothing could move without being studied and understood. And so little by little, the building was transformed. We were already ready in some rooms to put up the display while in others, the uh, working was going on. And really thanks to the help of everybody, starting with uh, the cleaning staff who was cleaning all night so that the, the dust could settle down and the following morning we could start working again, like really little by little, this miracle happened. Then 12,000 square meters of the museum, four floors of museum were transformed and now the new galleries could open in a completely renewed museum, making this new display really <clears throat> a point of reference. But let me tell you very briefly, why is the Egyptian collection in Turin? Well, all is start from this piece that you see in front of you. It's a wonderful, exquisite piece of metallurgy. It was saved by the ransack of the German in 1527 in Rome. It was brought to Mantua. And before 1626, it arrived in Turin. It represents the goddess Isis in the center, surrounded by other Egyptianizing gods. And the text that you see in the lines and columns are, is an Egyptianizing text. They're not real hieroglyphs, but they're certainly imitating hieroglyphs. Well, this was an altar, a bronze altar, which was um, probably placed in the temple of Isis in the Campus Martium in Rome. And um, when the cult of Isis developed all over the empire, we are in the first century AD, probably this altar was not produced, uh, it was not produced in Egypt, it was probably produced either in Campania or in Latium. And it's one of the few pieces of metallurgy which has survived from antiquity. 
It arrived in Turin, as I said, in 1626, in a very important moment, in the moment when the, the capital um, of um, the region had been moved from Chambéry to Turin, and the Duke of Turin needed a, um, a myth to justify this uh, movement of the uh, capital and to justify the reason why Turin should be seen as the legitimate capital. What a better reason than to say that Turin was founded by the Egyptians. And so this myth started in living the arrival of the Mensaisiaca, the founding in Industria, nearby Turin, of a temple devoted to Isis. The uh, fact that in the name Turin, there is the name Taurus, which means bull, and this bull could be interpreted as being the happiest bull of ancient Egypt. Well, all these elements tied together in creating this myth. And in 1759, the uh, Savoy family, the ruling family, sent Vitaliano Donati, which you see in this picture. Actually, this picture is imitating, as it were, uh, Giza. Uh, Vitaliano Donati went to Egypt to find elements that could explain the Mensa Isiaca. And he brought back some exquisite objects, starting from this wonderful uh, Isis of Coptos, see the um, narrow forehead, the curved nose, the almond-like eyes, the full lips about all elements typical of the 18th dynasty. And she represents actually the goddess Tia, the wife of Amenhotep III. And she is in the museum to welcome the visitors and to, uh, to show how important uh, this first uh, diving uh, figure, diving statue that arrived in uh, um, modern time, signed the transformation of our museum and our history. There are some people which we should mention because the really transformation, if we say 1626, the arrival of the Mensa 1759, the trip of Vitaliano Donati to uh, Egypt, and he brings back the wonderful statue that you have seen, also a statue of Ramses II and a wonderful lion statue of Asakman. But then the really turning point is 1824, when the uh, Drobetti collection was bought by the small kingdom of Sardinia. There are a few people that have a part in this. First and foremost, up on your left hand side, we see uh, Bernardino Drobetti. He was a consul general of France, but he was native of Barbania, a place nearby Turin. He collected 6,000 antiquities, he brought them to Livorno in Tuscany, and he, won, and he tried to sell them first to the Tsar in Russia, then to Paris, and finally he managed to sell it to Turin. I mean, to the kingdom of Sardinia, of which Turin was the capital. You have to uh, remember that at that time, in 1824, uh, Italy was not unified. Italy was unified in 1861. Italy was divided in seven small countries, one of which was the so-called kingdom of Sardinia, of which Turin was the capital. Carlo Vidua, which you see on your right hand side, uh, managed to go to Egypt in 1819. He saw the collection Drovetti and he wrote to the king and he said, Italy will be a great country only if this collection will be bought by the king. Well, this is quite amazing because he, see, he said Italy will be a great country, but Italy was not a country yet. I mean, it was not unified yet. But he said in this letter, only if we will buy this collection it will be a great country because we will have the most important Egyptian collection in Turin, the most important uh, um, uh, paintings collection in Florence, and the most important classical uh, museum in Rome. So this view is incredible, like seeing how the cultural heritage can be the fundament, the, 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 the spine, I would even say, on which a nation and a culture could be built on. But then it was King Carlo Felice who decided to build it. Actually, his brother, Victor Emmanuel I, had decided 
to uh, buy the collection, but then he abdicated in 1821 and Carlo Felice, his brother in 1823, decided to buy the collection. He bought the collection for 400,000 Piemontese lire, which nowadays would mean 60 million euros, which it means it is an enormous amount of money, but it's not only the investment of 60 million euros, we have to go back to what was the financial value at that time. And 60 million euros would mean 75% of the GDP of the Kingdom of Sardinia. Can you imagine that the king decides to spend 75% of the GDP just to buy this collection? And then the collection arrived. And the museum was at that time a place of study, a place where the then director, uh, we see a painting here of Lorenzo de Leani shown in the museum in the 19th century, when we see the director, Ario Dante Fabretti, standing in the galleries with a book in his hand, reading from a stila. And in the center of the room, we have one of the most important papyri. This papyri is so important, it's called the Royal Canon of Turin. It was studied by Jean-Francois Champollion, who said, in a letter, I have found a papyrus of such an importance that I barely dare to breed in the knowledge that my breath could condemn to uh, be forgotten and the, the name of kings which have survived for centuries. This is a king's list. This is one of the few chronological documents that we have on which we could build the history of ancient Egypt. So you have to understand that Jean-Francois Champollion, the Sarfer, the hieroglyphs, in 2022 and a few years later actually two years later in 1824 he arrived here and he had the chance to check his uh, discoveries with the first big collection was able to see and he was the first one to come and to study the collection here in Turin and then he went inside what we now call the galleries of kings, he said, well, a history of art of ancient Egypt and does exist. For the first time, before his eyes, he could see these beautiful statues. And you have to remember that at that time, Egyptian art was kind of considered of less value compared to Greek art. But then for the first time, he saw the beautiful king statues, royal statues, which were here. And when he looked at the statue, which is just below the head of Moses, this sitting statue with a scepter in its hand, is the statue of Ramses II, he said, well, this is the Apollo Belvedere on the ancient Egypt. He realized the value of this collection uh, for, um, for understanding the development of the history of art. And here you see, uh, here you see Jean-Francois Champollion uh, coming to Turin in 1824. And to him, we uh, owe uh, the in very important sentence, he said, the path to Memphis and Thebes goes through Turin. Recognize already at that time that Turin was the place devoted to Egyptology. 70 years later, after, so in 1824, the collection arrives, and 70 years later, Ernesto Schiaparelli becomes director of this museum. Is the most important director that this collection has ever had and will have had. Well, I'll give you numbers. The Dorvetti collection is 6,000 objects. Schiaparelli brought back more than 35,000 objects. So he enlarged enormously our uh, collection. He excavated in different places in the country, he gave the background from which the objects came from. We have an amazing archive. And in our archive, we have the history, uh, sedimented history of his uh, work. Here we are just at uh, the beginning of the Valley of the Kings, where he excavated and where he found in 1904, the tomb of Nefertari, uh, which model and objects you can see now in the exhibition. Uh, and uh, you see how important these photographs are because they really show the very moment when he arrived, when he started excavating, when he started clearing um, the uh, surface, and they give us the chance to give a stratigraphy. We have been going very carefully for the more than 14,000 pictures. And look at this, for instance, we are at the very moment 
where uh, is um, uh, Schiaparelli starting excavating Heliopolis. So here, where he is excavating Dera Medina at the very moment when the statue of Pendua and Nefertari was found. It was documented everything. It was documented the objects while they were excavating, the objects when they were excavating, where they were put into crates. And he would uh, write letters and also saying how the objects would be put into crates and would be sent. And this is allows us right now to reconstruct the history of our collection. If you, just to give you an example, if we go to uh, the 15th of, a, 15th of February 1906, Schiaparelli was excavating during Medina. Uh, there was a hole, by starting excavating this hole, turned out to be a shaft which was eight meter 30 deep. Then there were staircases. At the end of the staircase, there was this block made of stones, then a corridor, and then stones again. When we took them out, they found themselves in front of this door, which was still sealed. And they realized that the first time after 3,000 years, we were just about to open a room which has been sealed. And in making three-dimensional, the photographs that Schiaparelli took in 1906, we can re-enter now the burial chamber and live once more the very moment where Schiaparelli entered the burial chamber of the tomb of Ha and Merit, and when he found the sarcophagus of a sarcophagus of Ka still covered by the linen. On the right, the sarcophagus of Merit still covered by the linen, then the rest of fruit, bread, oil, beer, 467 objects which were found inside. This is a drawing that Schiaparelli made in 1927 for the publication, which he sent to the report uh, to His Majesty the King, Victor Emmanuel III. Here you see the workmen when they carry out all the objects out of the burial chamber. And now this amazing, unique tomb is all preserved in Turin. So look at the importance also of our archive. Not only we have the object, but thanks to the archive, we can really go back and live again that very moment and go back on the 15th of February, 1906. I repeat, it's the only in New Kingdom intact tomb housed outside of Egypt. The owner is Ha, uh, his title in Egyptian is Imi er Kaut Nezut, responsible for the works of the Pharaoh and his wife, Merit, the beloved one, She's called, uh, she has the title Nebet Per, the lady of the house. Well, sometimes we do believe that when you work in a museum, once uh, one of the features you have to have is to be humble, is what I call the humbleness of the researcher. We have a wonderful box uh, coming from the tomb of Ha, containing seven containers in alabaster, and these containers. Uh, I mean, they are still sealed, and we would really much like to know what there is inside it. But what should we do? Should we undo the ceiling and uh, should uh, so intervene in ruin something that has been intact for more than three thousand years? If we try to do X-rays, we cannot see what it is inside because X-rays are not uh, capable of penetrating stone. So what can we do? Well, the only thing that we can do is a neutron activation activity to see whether we can try to understand what is the shape of this container. We did it, we set up a project in order to analyze and understand what is inside these alabaster containers. We went to Oxfordshire and we started this thanks to the, the cooperation uh, that we had and the possibility that we had to use the synchrotone, we started analyzing these containers to see what we could see inside. And then it turned out that uh, what we were uh, thinking is actually true. You see, we can see the morphology, we can see uh, exactly the shape inside, but we can also see that there is residue that there is still the residue of liquids inside and probably the residue of what we call the seven sacred oils, the oils that were used for mummification and for the opening of the mouth ritual. What shall we do now? Shall we just open it in order to analyze them, in order to have uh, the composition because we can study how 
the uh, links between the uh, carbon atoms decayed. And so we can go back to the content of fat inside it and, and make a distinction between these seven oils. Well, it would be nice to do that, but that's when I say that we have to be humble. We have to stop, we have to say, well, we can come up to here, but it's up to next generations to go inside. Or when a moment will come that we allow us to, uh, to um, do research in these objects without damaging them. And I'm telling you that because on the 15th of February, 1906, as we have seen, Schiaparelli discovered the tomb of Ha and Merit. As I said, 467 objects have all been brought to Turin now and is one of the most uh, important uh, um, assemblage that we have in our museum. Schiaparelli at that time decided not to unwrap the mummies of Ha and Merit. In a moment when it was very normal to uh, unwrap the mummies, sometimes that was done publicly so that the people would come to museum to see what is inside. There was this curiosity to see how the Egyptians were able actually to defeat death, to have their bodies still being preserved after so many millennia. Well, what you are seeing right now was never so by Schiaparelli, was never seen by Schiaparelli. Actually, you see the unwrapping of the mummy. We see that the mummy is skeletized, that the only part of the skin is preserved. But look at how amazing it is. It still has all these jewels. Can you imagine in a museum like the Museo Egizio, which is extremely rich in material culture, but we're extremely poor in jewels. Actually, we do not have uh, jewels inside these mummies. Caparelli never saw what you're seeing now. This mummy was completely covered with jewels. But let us have a look. We see that around the neck, he has this amazing necklace, which is called Gold of Honor, of color of Shabir, which was uh, the major gift that a king could give to his most important officials to thank them for what they had done for the state. Hanging from this neck, he has a necklace. At the end of the necklace, there is this wonderful heart scarab with a golden framework around it. He has this bracelet on his arm and he has jewels and amulets uh, disposed around the mummies according to Book of the Dead chapter 100 and 56. So the rituality has been followed completely in doing this. Then we can see, uh, we can have medical information, we can see vascular calcification, we can see that he had arthrosis, lumbar arthrosis uh, in his uh, back, but he also had arthrosis in the knees, and uh, um, he also had what we call the syndrome of the tennis player, uh, because he had uh, uh, the inflammation of the elbow tendons, uh, which is a very important information because probably this is also due to the kind of job he was doing. I told you uh, that his title is Emir Kautnesut, responsible for the work of the pharaoh. We always translate this as an architect, but probably is foreman. He was working in developing a project and doing the work itself. And then we found out that his brain, his heart, his bronchial tube, lungs, liver, and uh, bald bladder is still there. It was not exacerbated, it was not eviscerated. It is amazing because when we publish this information, um, many universities around the world ask us, could we have some analysis. Could we have some samples to do DNA analysis? And our answers was no, not because we're against research, but because here again, the humbleness of the researcher, we have to say, now is the moment to step back. We cannot intervene in any way. We have to respect the human remains. We have, we have the responsibility to preserve them as, uh, as good as we possibly can and to transfer them to the coming generations. And 
probably in the future, there will be a way when you can do endoscopic analysis at the instance without um, intervening directly, without damaging in any way. When Schiaparelli found this mummy in 1906, he could have never thought that you uh, today we would be able to share by a screen, can you imagine, from Turin to the United States and looking inside the mummy, and the mummy is actually resting inside his coffin and is still completely wrapped. This seems like uh, science fiction uh, compared to, I mean, going back to 100 years ago. So we still have to believe in research. We still have to believe in the development that research will do. And we have to say, well, with the knowledge that we have now, that is where we stop. I do believe that this is one of the major tasks of a museum. A museum can say what well, it does, studying the biography of the objects, in trying to reconstruct the past, in try and be transparent also, in saying that little by little, we are trying to go nearer to the truth, absolute truth, and uh, the absolute essence of how Egypt was in ancient times, though, is probably something we will never achieve. But generation by generation, we will come nearer and our understanding will become greater. And so here you see once more Ka, and Ka that now is being rewrapped. And uh, uh, well, I, I have to say uh, that this uh, technology now we apply to many um, different mummies. We also have a gallery which is called In Search of Life, where the mummies are housed in a very respectful way. And then we show how we can do the unwrapping of the mummy themselves. It's also interesting because in doing the 3D model, then we can uh, look layer by layer. So here we see the mummy of merit. We can look inside the mummy. So this is his wife. We discover that she has a second wig because we already have a wig of real hair preserved uh, in her uh, burial goods, which is exhibited in the permanent galleries. But there was a second wig of real hair. She has this wonderful waza color and those earrings. And uh, now we can actually print them. So actually what we did is from a 3D model, uh, we did a printout uh, of the uh, color of honor of Ka, of the high scarf of Ka, of the Wazak uh, color of merit. And actually, as you see the printout, it's not that satisfactory. You see that there are, uh, uh, well, is not so neat in the details. Uh, and this is due to many, to two different reasons. First of all, the um, CT scan that we did is of course a medical CT scan. And from there we derived this model. A medical CT scan is made of course for human tissues and it's not made to detect the peculiarities of hard stones and metals. We are now studying whether we can do an industrial CT scan, which is possible, or we have to be sure that it doesn't affect in any way the physiological nature of the uh, mummy itself. Once we can have a more precise 3D model, then we can also think of another way of printing, printing by subtraction and not by addition with worm resin, as we have done in this case. So you see, there was a color, you see the rings, the earrings, and actually this is uh, something, is an ongoing project because we want to uh, reach better results. And in the near future, we can have the rapid uh, mummies of Ha and Merit and the jewels printed out in gold. You're watching now another incredible um, assemblage that we have, which is the tomb of Eti and Neferu. Eti, his title was Emir Vermeer Shah, responsible of the army in Jebelain, 30 kilometers to the south of Thebes, nowadays Luxor. There were 31 paintings found inside the, um, the tomb, which were detached by Lucarini and brought to Italy, mounted uh, conserve and mounted with a, uh, a framework and exhibited for the first time in Florence. So you see also how they were exhibiting as if they were 
paintings as if, as if this was a painting exhibition. What we did now was trying to give a, an archaeological context. We have our archive photo. We know exactly from which pillar and which walls each one of the paintings come from, and we want to give them the proper background. We started when we started starting with imaging, how they were, uh, uh, if we see any rest, for instance, with infrared, and we understood actually that two paintings that now we have uh, separated should be mounted in a different way because this kind of conservation, which was done at uh, the beginning of last century, was not correct. It was also interesting to do a kind of analysis with different kind of lights to see details which with the naked eye would not be visible. So we use infrared, we use, of course, normal photograph or visible light, we use um, UV ray, and we also use a UV false color. It's incredible to see, look at the beauty of this Egyptian blue, the first artificial pigment which was used. And also look how, the, uh, um, the painting was done, they would just trace the contour and then with sponges which were uh, inserted in the pigments, they would just do the feather of the birds and look how beautiful it is. There are all kinds of details actually, which with the naked eye would not be visible and that's why um, infrared can be very important. First of all, you can see that we can detect now a writing in a writing on top of this figure. Uh, and we are still trying to understand actually what is written there. Or look at here, you see a um, monkey uh, running up this rope on the, uh, on the bark and it was not visible. Uh, before the infrared, but once you have done the infrared rounds, you have been able to understand what is there, you can really reconstruct the whole figure. And sometimes there are surprises that come out when you use the XRF to understand what is the kind of um, material that was used. Of course, everybody would think uh, the water would have been in blue, in Egyptian blue, but it turned out that this uh, was um, carbon black, which uh, made us, uh, uh, well, we are, we are really surprised that it's carbon black and not blue as the water should be, but also this give you insight in the painting and makes you realize. And here you see how the display it is nowadays with the rebuilding of the 16 pillars and the placing of the paintings where they come from, including the central chapel of uh, E.T. and Neferu. In other words, in studying the biography of the objects, we can really give back their context. We have an enormous collection of animal mummies, and sometimes it's very interesting to see how Egyptian treated this animal mummy. Look at this uh, crocodile, and it's one meter 90, and then this you see after conservation, when we did the x-rays, we just discovered there is not a, an adult crocodile there, but just a little one in front of the crocodile. This is what I call the pragmatism of ancient Egypt, Egyptian. Well, in doing that, in refining a very nice um, mummy who contain a ceremonial crocodile, probably they, you, they reach the maximum result. Uh, let's hope that the god Sobek was satisfied anyway, but was cheaper to have just a small crocodile instead of an adult to be um, mummified. So we have a beautiful mummies of uh, cats and I want to uh, unwrap together with you one of them to see how many information we can get also from animal mummies. We use the same technique. So it's an algorithm that we developed that allows to unwrap layer by layer. It's quite difficult because the composition of, of the linen and, and the fibers of the linen and uh, the skin and the, the, the skin and the hair of the animal is very similar. So you have to be very careful how you peel it down so that you can observe what you have. So here is our cat, pretty well preserved in a so-called barrel position. It has uh, is two years old, and uh, as you see, 
of the skin and the skeleton is good preserved. And then we had the first surprise. In the eye sockets, we saw these two blue things. And so, well, my, uh, our first thought, ours and of the vets was, okay, well, those are stones which have been put in the eye socket. But it turned out that this is not what is going on because uh, um, the radiologist said, well, no, this looks like organic material, is not a, a hard stain, but uh, so he, he's implying that these should be the remains of the eyes that have been preserved. Well, here once more, how can you be sure? So we have a discordant hypothesis. The only way to figure it out would be to take a sample, but once more, we have to step back. In doing images analysis, we even see that it was a pattern. Look at that in pink on the front of the, uh, the cat. And this is also very interesting to show how, uh, first of all, very use all the textiles and there was a pattern uh, in the textile. And so uh, since now we are not polychromous anymore, we don't realize how vivid they were in color. And sometimes we tend to have an older image of uh, antiquity. That's why making analysis on the pigment, making images, see the difference between the reconstruction and how it is nowadays. But I assure you, the pink I showed you is really there because it has been detected in the analysis we did. I want to show you something we have been doing research for a long time on. This is really part of my own research. I study uh, what I call the um, yellow coffin of the third intermediate period. One of the most important coffin in our collection is the coffin of um, Butamo. We did uh, a CT scan of the coffin itself. Uh, we did it in cooperation with the Polytechnic of Milan. We wanted to do the the most perfect CT scan possible. And that gave us a result of the 3D model on which we could uh, uh, have a, a video mapping with a sub millimetrical uh, precision. So actually what you see before your eyes is uh, as precise as the coffin that you have. Then I wanted to mount in this 3D model all the information we had on the coffin. So we did also the X-rays, and this was mounted on the model. And when we did the X-rays, we saw that the coffin is composed of 13 different parts of wood belonging to previous coffins. And this really shocked us, because the owner of the coffin is Bute Amon. He lived at the time of Ramses XI, and he received the task to go through the necropolis and save the um, sarcophagi which were plundered. But when we look at some details, we saw that uh, underneath his chin, there was a beard and the beard now has been removed. We saw that he had two stretch hands that had been turned into two fists. And so the, the, the fingers have been cut out. And this is also a change of gender because two stretch hands are typical of a woman, two fists are typical of a man. We saw that in exactly four parts, underneath the polychromous surface that we see now, there is some black bitumen. And this belonged to an earlier phase of the coffin, 600 years before the beginning of the 18th, 18th dynasty, when the coffins were decorated in this way. We saw that there are pieces of wood which were inserted to keep together all the different parts. And when we look at the base, we see that the base is way too small to be a space and a wooden framework has been put around it. If we paste all this information together, actually we see that the coffin was wood, on top of wood there was clay, on top of the clay there was textile, and then huntite and calcite. When the ancient artist made the drawing in red, then he started decorating with the pigment, which was black and ochre. Then he added Egyptian blue and Egyptian green. And at the end, he added orpiment. This color base of the arsenicum gives this yellow appearance when in a moment of crisis in Egypt, when gold would not be used for the decoration of the coffins. If going inside with images, it seems as if it gives all the answer. Actually, 
it makes uh, uh, ask ourselves other questions because we do not know where those men were working on the workshops and where we are building the coffins. How did this workshop work? When would you choose to go where? And was it not considered blasphemous to reuse part of previous coffins? How is it possible that Butaham, who had to receive the task to put in safety coffins which were plundered, as we read in the uh, robbery papyrus in London, he himself took part of coffins to build his own coffin. And the coffin at this time, was it still called Per and Jet, House of Eternity? If so, how is it possible that this eternity lasted for so little that the coffins could be reused. We have one example, the coffin of Ichi in the Vatican Museum, when we see that the grandmother, the mother, the granddaughter reused the same coffins. Was the coffins used only during the um, ritual of the opening of the mouth? And to make it even more complicated, read together with me the following text, which really puzzles us once more. It's an ostracon in the Louvre, and we read, O noble coffin of the singer of Amonic Tai, who rests inside you. Listen to me so that you can convey my message as you're near. Tell her, how are you? How are things? So, Butamo lives longer than uh, his um, wife. And uh, when he misses his wife, he doesn't write to uh, his wife, his wife is dead, he bright to the coffin of his wife. So he has the task to put the coffin into safety. While doing that, he reused them to build his own coffins. And when he missed his wife, he wrote to the coffin of his wife. This showed the complexity of ancient Egypt and the, the, the beauty of working in a museum as others, because uh, we, try to make through the material culture to build bridges in order to understand the past and to understand the biography of those who lived before us. And I want to end trying to give you a sense of what the future might be. What do we miss in our museums? What well, we miss the landscape? What do we miss in the Museo Jitsu in Turin? We miss Egypt. How can we acquire Egypt? Well, in going there, doing research, doing excavation, doing photogrammetry, and bringing the landscape to the museum. This is the place where we excavate, is Saqqara. We are excavating to the north of the tomb of Maya. And we're excavating an extension of 40 meters where we encounter many different structures, which I will briefly analyze with you in a moment. New technologies, those, allows us nowadays to capture all the morphological changes, to capture all the morphological details of objects and the structure we were in. And we, the, we have heard a lot of discussion about the metaverse, but how wonderful could be the metaverse for us in museum, could be the reconstructing of the past, the reconstructing of the landscape, a new way of displaying, a new way of placing the objects in the monuments of where originally from, a way of building up the impossible Egyptian museum and putting together all the information we have. I want to show you how important it is to bring the landscape. If you just have one flask like this in a museum, you can make uh, different photographs, you made a 3D model, you create a mesh, and then from that, uh, in doing the algorithm, you have the 3D models, you can even print it out. And then you can interpret in many different ways. You can study the typology, you can give them a date, you can do residues analysis to see what it was inside. But if you don't really know where it came from, your information would be very limited. How could we say more? Who would say more about this flask? Well, in this case, if this is coming from the field. And so we know exactly where it comes from. There is a part of the story that can still be told. And that's why the landscape, that's why the context becomes so important. So we can actually document the very moment when it was found. Here it is. It was found together with a heap of shirts just outside of the tomb. You see, we have different targets outside of the tomb because we use a total station to document, to have a GIS and to give the exact position. But then you see also how the color change it is. You go from yellow sand 
to this darkish area, to this uh, almost black area, and then you know that you are on archaeological site, and we found these concentration heaps of um, pottery. But in observing that they are just outside of a shaft, we realize that these are embalming caches. This is a residue of what remained over the embalming, but embalming was sacred, so there was no way that you could discard the material that you used, so it was buried just outside the shaft. And the shaft, you know, is the link between the real of the living and the real of the dead. In going down, you go to the burial chamber and uh, you separate or you give a new space to the disease. The necropolis and be, has been reused and reused during centuries. And within one meter and a half, we have such a complex stratification of objects that we have to be so careful in the uh, documentation so that we avoid to destroy any details. We have to keep in mind that there is nothing more uh, dangerous than archaeology. Archaeologists do not build anything, they destroy anything, they take layer after layer. And so for us, it's very important to document meticulously everything we find. In this area we are operating, we see in the left hand part, you can clearly see actually the beginning of a monumental gate. And so there are mud bricks, so there were slabs of limestone and through this monumental gate we enter in a courtyard we still see two columns in c2 and this is part of uh, probably 18th dynasty tomb new kingdom tomb belonging to a person we still don't know that the tomb has been only partially excavated in 2019 when we were not able to go back to egypt because of the pandemic but we are planning to go back in September, inshallah, and to excavate inside, to, to see whether we can find a name. And the name could tell us maybe who is the owner and whether there are objects in the European or American museum that belong to this tomb, whether we can give a background. But you see that we have found all kinds of chapels in limestone. So chapels are later in time. They belong to the Ramasite period. We are 300 years later, and they all belong to priests of Ptah. Very often, we found in descriptions Mhat and Ptah on the front part of Ptah, which means those priests were carrying the statue of Ptah uh, in procession and were on the front part of it. You see in different colors the different stratigraphy that we have. We go from a Ramasite period. So 13th, 12th century um, BC to the 8th, 4th century BC, all the way to the 4th, 6th century um, AD. And actually here, the, the last part, so the most recent part, what we see in blue is the moment where the Copts went to leave in the necropolis. They wanted to be separated by um, the uh, city. They wanted to go in the necropolis to think about their uh, um, faith, to think about Jesus, to read the gospel. And so they were living actually in the city of the dead. In front of the chapel, which still is the realm of the living, where the living go and bring offerings, there's always a shaft. So the tomb has always this dichotomy. The chapel functions for the living. The be more beautiful it is, the more the social status of the living uh, raises. And then you have the shaft going down. In this case, it's 4 meter 30. So we can go down and penetrate and go what we and see what we find inside it. And we are now underneath the ground, 4 meter 30 below the ground. And we see that there are three rooms to the east, one on the uh, uh, west and to the south. And when we look up, we see that the ceiling is completely blackened. Well, this was immediately for us a sign to understand that, of course, we were not the first one to go there, that the shaft had been plundered in antiquity. And I can say in antiquity because in antiquity, of course, there was not a market, an art market. People would go inside put it on fire so that they could separate stones for precious metals. Well, 
this insight in the landscape, the knowledge that we can get from the necropolis allows us to understand what this next step of museum will be when even thanks to metaverse, we will be able to bring back the landscape in museum. We will be able to understand and contextualize the object. We will be able to go deeper into the biography of the object. I do believe that the future of museum is for and for more research, disciplinary research, multidisciplinary research, and the new technology and innovation will bring us to the next step in our epistemological uh, attempt to understand the past and to use the material culture to build a bridge between us and the generation which were before. I foresee a beautiful future of research where all the objects scattered around the world can be put together, understood, published and studied together and live in a landscape that we can reconstruct and this will enhance our capacity of understanding the past. I hope that in wandering in the galleries and the exhibition, you will grasp the beauty of ancient Egyptian objects and be captured by the curiosity to deepen your knowledge and to understand how important it is for us and for humankind to preserve this material culture. I thank you so much for listening to me and really hope you will enjoy the exhibition.